Welcome to Crash Concepts, where the economy, energy, and the environment are explored. Up next, fresh ideas and insights into the factors that are driving the world and shaping your future. Presenting information you can't afford to live without, here's Chris Martinson. Welcome to this Peak Prosperity Podcast. I am your host, Chris Martinson. I have to confess, like many novices and professionals alike, I am finding it difficult to make any logical sense of today's financial markets when looking at Spanish 10-year debt trading at record low yields or German 10-year debt looking like it might test 1%, 1%, bonds are making a strong case for deflation. And so is gold, which continues to head downwards despite any and all geopolitical events. Yet when we wander over to the land of equities, we see nothing but blue skies, complete faith apparently in reflation and inflation, and a future of even more spectacular corporate health, as evidenced by the fact that the best performing equities of the past year by far were those with the trashiest balance sheets. So who's right? Neither? Both? Is it possible there's no good signal left to analyze after more than five years of extreme financial repression? Well... To help us make sense of all this today is someone I recently met at the Wine Country Conference and whose views I immediately respected for a number of reasons. First, I found his views to be pragmatic, very reasonable, and clearly formed with the wide view that comes from experience and a travel schedule that involves 30 or more countries a year. With us today is Steen Jacobson, Chief Investment Officer of Saxo Bank. He has more than 25 years of experience within fields of proprietary trading and alternative investment. His career has taken him from Citibank in Copenhagen to Hafnia Merchant Bank to Chase Manhattan in London and then to Swiss Bank also in London. After a few more transitions, he joined Saxo Bank in 2000 and after a brief departure to Lima's Capital Partners, where he was chief investment officer for two years, he returned to the bank in 2011 as chief investment officer. Steen, it's a real pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you for having me, Chris. Now, you said in your presentation at the Wine Country Conference that you are the most optimistic you've ever been in the last 30 years. That was 27 long days ago, an eternity. Do you still hold that view? Absolutely. Um, I think that as your intro sort of indicated, we have a very interesting setup where we, I call it the Bermuda Triangle of Economics. We have high stock market valuations. We have very low uh, employment growth, and we have almost zero productivity and innovation in the economy. And we ask ourselves, how is that sustainable? And the way I explain that, at least to myself, is is what I call the 80-20 rule. So if you think about monetary policy, if you think about the political capital invested into fighting this crisis, 95% of that capital, 95% of the, the uh, political credibility went into saving the 20% of the economy, which is the listed companies. So essentially what has been going on is we've seen a transfer from the workers, we've seen a transfer from the 80%, the SMEs, the small and medium-sized enterprises, to the bigger companies. So the banks, the indirectly quasi-owned government entities, and the listed companies. So what you see every day in the newspaper, Wall Street Journal, whatever newspaper you pick up, is the 20%. The problem with that is that the 80% of the economy is these small and medium private enterprises, as I stated. But they constitute 100% of all private sector job growth. So if you cut up the 100% job growth sector and leave it to the 20%, the government and the listed companies, then of course you have an economy which is stale, but where the valuation makes sense because there's so much cheap money flowing to the 20%, but it is it is direct, directing money away from the productive side of the economy. And why is a need so productive that's so important for an economy? It is simply because they work harder, longer, higher risk tolerance, and they have a greater risk appetite in terms of, of doing new things because the only way they do survive, of course, is to renew themselves and be an integral part of the economy. And that is where we are today. So we have this kept in place by this 80-20 rule, and as long as we continue with um, uh, assets purchases and policies which is conducted through the monetary policy, we're really only helping the 20% of the economy listed companies. And in terms of inequality, we're only really helping the 0.5% richest people in the world that do own exactly the same amount of stocks. 
So I, I certainly can uh, understand what you're talking about. I, I worked in large corporations and I, I have a SME myself now, and, and uh, my level of productivity is, is uh, orders of magnitude higher working at, at an SME. And so this is interesting, this 80-20 transfer that you're talking about, that happens, are, are you saying that's had, did that happen in the U.S., Europe, and Japan? Did it happen everywhere? Was this a, a, an intentional policy? Yes, because if you ask the central bank, and they do know that quantitative easing creates inequality, mm -hmm. that is exactly what they call the wealth effect. So if they can create the wealth effect, they believe that that could trickle down into the middle class, the middle class then will spend some more money. The problem, of course, being the middle class owns SME companies. They don't own public listed companies. So you have a policy which maybe not in its construction was meant to do this, but it was the indirect consequences of keeping this policy in place for too long. It's not that I'm against quantitative easing as a short-term phenomenon to stabilize the economy, but I don't think anywhere in academics, at least I haven't seen it, maybe you have, Chris, is there any evidence that you can create new jobs through low monetary, uh, no, low interest rate? What you do know, however, is that if you allow the SME sector to have better framework, lower taxes, less paperwork, uh, access to credit, you immediately get not only growth, but you get exponential growth at, at the peripheral. Uh, and that is exactly what the U.S. needs. And, and as, you, as goes to your question, what is interesting is wherever I go in the world, I can have the same speech, whether it's in the U.S., South Africa, Sweden, uh, Czech, or uh, anywhere. So, so pretty much anywhere in the world, 80% of the economy will be SMEs. And they will be that very, very important part in terms of kickstarting the economy. So for me, the solution to this crisis, a lack of job, a lack of growth, is really simple. You need to conduct and have a proactive policy of helping the SMEs. And then you have to forget about the 20%. But you and I know both, Chris, that the financial lobby, the political lobby, will always be in place for the 20% and not for the 80%. And that's the other part of the equation which really concerns me, because who are the SMEs? How... How do they see themselves? Where is their lucky, uh, lobby uh, mechanism in terms of going to Washington and get concessions from the government? Simply not there. Oh, I totally agree. So, Steen, let's talk history for a minute. You said interest rates lead the economy by nine months. What did you mean by that first? Yeah, I think it's interesting in a world where we have metadata, big data, we have quantitative analysis, uh, we have PhDs coming out of our ears, mm -hmm. but no one really just look in simple terms and create a simple sort of uh, method to look at the economy. So what we've done some work on is to figure out, okay, we need to create some very simple rules to understand why the market is doing what, it do to do, what it's doing today. And, and my nine months rule goes and, and, and leads every single rule of thumb I have, and it says, what happened nine months ago is what impacts what goes on in the marketplace today. So let's go back to May of last year. The Federal, so the Federal Reserve Chairman uh, Benanke went in front of the uh, Congress and made his uh, semi-annual uh, testimony. He uttered this very, very new word for, for me at least, tapering. All of a sudden, 10 year U.S. yield is up 140 basis point. For some reason, the economist thinks that doesn't, that doesn't have an impact on the economy. My rule says, well, nine months from starting this cycle, there will be an impact on the economy. And true to form, of course, uh, just this morning as we're doing this interview, the GDP for U.S. came in at minus 1%. And Chris, you and I know less than four months ago, everyone was talking about, like, this year is going to be the year of the recovery. IMF, World Bank, uh, Federal Reserve was all projecting higher growth rates for the economy ignoring the nine-month rule. So for your listeners, it's, it's a very simple rule. If you want to understand what goes on today, find the front page of the newspaper nine and 12 months ago, and you know exactly why we are where we are in terms of the economic cycle. Well, then what sorts of messages are you reading into today's interest rates where we have the 10-year U.S. Uh, yield at 2.5% and it's come down quite a bit? You've got uh, basically sovereign debt yields all over the place heading down. W what are you reading from that? So um, th what the rule then tells you is that in 9, 12 months from now, you need to look for a significant pickup in a economic activity. But, but just as the 140 basis point hike out of tapering 9, 12 months ago had a negative impact, you also have to now price in 2015 ha second half to be positive. So what we're seeing in our model, the model we use today, is that we will see the low in economic activity, inflation expectation, 
uh, innovation productivity between Q1 and Q2 of 2015. And then we will have a very sharp rise of activity, inflation expectation as we go into the second half of 2015. And to be totally honest, Chris, it's so primitive, I'm almost embarrassed to talk about it. <laughs> but that is exactly because there is a 9 to 12 months lead for what goes on today. So in May of June next year, we will have a flattening out of the negativity, the proactivity for central banks trying to do something uh, in terms of the economy. And the economy in itself will be healing because the financing cost is coming down for everybody in the economy, not just the 20% of the economy being listed. Well, I'm, I'm very interested then in, in uh, how this might translate into what the ECB might do. You know, we have a lot of talk coming out uh, from the ECB. There's a possibility of negative interest rates, maybe QE as well. What do you think is actually going to be decided at the June meeting? And do they have access to this uh, incredibly detailed model that says, uh, look forward nine months? <laughs> I wish they had. That will save a lot of money and a lot of work for a lot of people, to be honest, Chris. We could just agree on this model. I think the world would be a better place. But in terms of the ECB, you have to remember the ECB and certainly this president, Mr. Draghi, they love to talk and they hate to act. Mm. And what you will see probably with the uh, June uh, 5th meeting at the ECB is that the ECB will deliver, but they will deliver far less than the market expects. So I do expect a repo cut. I do expect that they will take a chance with negative deposit rates, but I do not expect that they will activate the uh, the asset purchase program. In uh, in other words, a full full monthly in terms of the uh, the quantitative easing because they are afraid of how they can control this. And and don't forget, in the Federal Reserve System, you have one country, one bond market. In the EU. In the European DCB banks world, you have 28 different individual markets that you need to proactively go into. And underneath that, there is a number of rules, among them being that the German government can only own a certain amount of its own bonds. So there's a huge complexity, which, in my opinion, will let the politicians do what they do best, which is to wait and see, uh, and, and policy makers, politician policy makers, which is to wait and see and just see if there's more data coming through. Ironically, in my opinion, that is exactly what's needed. I think the policymaker of the world should take a 24, 36 months sabbatical mm -hmm. and just forget about the market and let the market heal itself. Because what we don't need right now is a lot of talk and no action, and we need no action uh, at all, in my opinion. And I think I think I mentioned that at the conference as well. Think about Belgium; they were without a government for 24 months very recently. What happened during those 24 months was that the, every single macro indicator improved during that period. <laughs> An N of one, a good experiment, though. I think we should repeat it for a, a couple of other places. Now, what well, I'm you had it in the U.S. to some extent. I mean, some, some Americans like to disagree with it, but I will argue that Bill Clinton, one of the most successful American presidents in terms of creating growth and actually running a, current, uh, a budget deficit, he had a lot of plans, but his ability to implement anything during his eight years was very, very small. They had a policy of a strong dollar, but the only thing they ever did was to sell the dollar in the Mexican crisis, right? Mm -hmm. so, so you had a president that, that talked again a lot, but he did absolutely nothing in terms of implementation of, of policies. And, and, and that created this you know, tremendous uh, upswing in the, U, in the U.S. economy. Well, Steen, if, if you're comfortable, I'm really very interested to get your take on the recent EU elections and how this might bear, if at all, on, on what the ECB is, is going to think to do. So what, if anything, shifts as a result of the elections and, and what sort of messages were sent to the incumbent politicians, do you think? That's a lot of analysis that, that needs to be done on this. Mm -hmm. But I think if you look in political terms, it's important to notice that in the UK, in France, in Denmark, uh, in a number of countries, the EU skeptics won outright. We're talking about getting 25, 30% of the vote in a multi-party uh, system. So this is significant change. A number of countries, mainly what we call the old countries, the northern countries, that turn aggressively against the EU. So around northern Europe, there's a lot of parties right now who's trying to redefine their policies on the EU because in Europe, most center-left and center-right parties will be pro-Europe. They will have one or two issues with Europe, but overall, they're always uh, joining the, the, the I uh, line when there's something going on in Europe. But their voters is clearly telling them they don't agree with what goes on in Europe. Uh, so that's lesson number one. 
in terms of the new European Parliament, it's very interesting that the European Parliament started out with very little democratic, uh, direct democratic uh, um, election into it. Now they've been giving more powers and more electability in terms of democracy. But in a political system where you have in the EU, the, uh, I, may, may, I should probably note that the power of the EU sits with the EU Council where you had a head of state. Now you have the head of state EU council minister meeting, as it's called, and you have the European Parliament almost sharing 50-50 the power of Europe. So inside the European council uh, meetings, you will have infight between France and Germany, between the Club Met and, and, and the, the Club North country. In the European Parliament, you have all these anti-EU, pro-EU. So you are creating an additional layer of complexity where the conclusion will have to be that less will be done and at the time horizon in terms of fiscal deficits and reforms, of course, again, has been delayed into the very, very long future. Uh, so, so this is unfortunately the move which makes Europe less able to act. It's a move, it's, it's an election that sort of clearly showed you that the European politician is totally out of touch with their voters. Not dissimilar to what I feel is going on in the US, to be honest, Chris. But the final thing, and I need to say, say this, that the thing about the EU is that you can change, if you're very, very, very fortunate and very lucky, you can change the pace of the Europe moving forward, but you cannot change its direction. There's so much political capital invested in the EU. There's so much uh, bureaucratic momentum built in that it is impossible to reverse a process. So this will never be about getting Europe to stop or, or reverse to another course. It will be about speeding the speed limit on the EU uh, turning uh, south, going downwards, uh, because you cannot change the pace of Europe, the uh, direction of Europe, but you can change the pace. And that, that I think is the three conclusions. Number one, they will lead to no reforms. Uh, there'll be a violation of all the austerity measures. France, Spain will all get uh, renewed uh, in date goal lines in terms of uh, fulfilling this goal, and there'll be no reforms. So we will do just doing uh, wait and see again. And in terms of political parties, a lot of the political parties will become more pro, pro, proactively negative the EU to get their voters back from the far left and the far right. And finally, the EU process continues as if, but it will continue at a slower pace. At a slower pace. So that that certainly fits well with your do nothing uh, uh, admonition there. So if if uh, if that's what's happening on the political side, does that this, does this at all change what the ECB thinks it might do or what its mandate is, or does it insert a, additional caution into its actions for the June fifth meeting? No, because they, they they wouldn't be doing the same conclusion. They will look at this and say, we are an independent central bank. We need to do what we think is right. Unfortunately, they don't use the nine month model. They use you know just classic forward guidance. And the thing with central bank is I have a doc who is better at predicting what goes on in, in, in the world economy than any central bank in the world uh, by, just, by just throwing a ball to the guy. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and they're useless. They're hopeless. I mean, don't forget Greenspan before he became Fed chairman. He was a Fed watcher. Barons rank him in the bottom 10% as a Fed watcher before he became chairman. So, so I mean, these guys is dogmatic. They don't understand what goes on. So the ECB will be reactive, not proactive. If they were proactive, they would already be out fighting deflation through significantly lower repo rates and an activation of this SME sector. Because don't forget, from an economist's point of view, there's really only two ways of increasing the CPI if we use CPI as the inflation measure. And that is to have wage inflation, which is not happening in a world with excess mm -hmm. capacity and too high unemployment. And the other one is to increase the velocity of money. And the way you increase velocity of money can only happen in two ways, really. You can lose faith in its, uh, the value of the money, which uh, may ultimately happen, but I don't think it's happened in the next 50 years, 100 years, or you can have loan demand increase. So it's very, very simple. If you just break down the mechanics, the, the modus operandi of how an economy works, how you have to monitor transmission, the only thing you can do something about right now is to get the lending velocity up. The velocity lending up means that you need to shortcut the 20% and activate the 80% of the economy. You will immediately get a huge boost in, in, uh, in, in velocity of money, which will increase the uh, inflation expectation. The ECB, Federal Reserve, Bank of Jane will be, all of a sudden will be at uh, their expected inflation levels and growth will be coming back through activation of this inactive sector. 
You know, it's very interesting. You know, I, I think that of the things you just mentioned there, uh, Japan is certainly trying to ruin the faith of the people in its in its currency. And if I lived in Japan, I, I would take them at face value and not wait anymore. But um, uh, they've they've had tremendous difficulty getting the velocity of money to go up through what I consider to be fairly extreme efforts uh, to both talk down the value of the yen and to convince people that they should spend them now with tax policies, with a variety of monetary policies. They, they've done what they can. It hasn't really worked. So, so obviously structural issues uh, really rule the day. And so then we wander over into the wage side of your story. And there's some really interesting structural um, issues there on the wage side so that we do see that uh, I think U.S. CEOs just broke the $10 million average uh, compensation mark. And uh, and there's really some sort of a, a, a big paradox, as you mentioned at the at the wine country conference between the two ends of the labor markets. These feel structural to me. Uh, are they immune to policy? Is there anything policy can do? And, and what did you mean uh, first by that labor paradox? Yeah, so, so my, my theory is that in certain parts of the labor market, there is certainly waste demand increase. If you want an IT guy in California, you are paying up every single time you try to sign someone. The same in Austin, which of course be due to tax benefits, is seen a huge influx of companies moving to, to Austin. So you can have local markets, local job description having uh, very high demand and high wage demand pressure. But at the other end, the people who has been left behind in the globalization, in the transformation of the society to being one of being online instead of being intangible assets, then you have so then you have the opposite. So you have wage power at the top and you have no at the at the other end. So I think there are two unemployment queues in the world today. One queue where people can be retrained and can get back into the market so can recover, but also a, a, an unemployment queue where people will never work again. And I think we have a social responsibility to address that issue. And it is part of that rising inequality uh, equation we have. But if we go back to Japan, and I think it, it's, it's an excellent example because in worst case, the U.S., the world ends in a, what we call a Japanization, low growth, uh, low growth, uh, no hope in terms of creating inflation and everyone owning bonds. And, you know, to some extent, if you're really afraid of the future, you can argue the, the bond rally going on right now could be, you know, an early part of a, another Japanization lag. But in Japan, for, you have to look at the, the context. Why are there structural issues in Japan? They have one of the lowest women participation rates in the world. They have the worst demographics of the G10 countries. They have a corporate structure, which is still uh, cross-ownership, and they have lack of accountability in terms of uh, uh, the accounting rules. And then on top of that, they have very few foreigners in terms of uh, running the business to you know renew the management skills and everything else. So Japan is a society that benefits from being in deflation because they are huge net savers. They lose what equates to about $20 billion of GDP every year due to the birth and death rate. So in Japan, more people die than get born every year, and that costs the society $20 billion right now, increasing to over $100 billion over the next 10 years. So think about this, Chris. Japan as an economy needs to find roughly $50, $100 billion just to break even, so to speak, in, in growth terms. That means huge pressure on innovation, productivity. That is not happening in Japan because the market, the local market, where you have to test this, the SME companies, the breakthrough companies, everyone wants to work for a big company playing it safe. And no one wants to go into the SME because there's no incentive at that end of the spectrum, both in the labor market, but also in terms of your, your, your prospect to maintain this job. So. A lot of what goes on in the world is structural, but to say that you, we can't address it is absolutely wrong. In Japan, you can increase immigration, you can increase labor uh, participation by women, you can, uh, you can make uh, uh, school reform so you, the women can, get, uh, can pick up their children at the candy Scandinavia at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, not at 2 o'clock as it is right now. So there's a lot and simple things that can be done that will not cost society anything net in terms of utility. But these society maintain the status quo because, and that is another big, big rule of mine, that what we've seen since 89 where we celebrated the free markets uh, when the Berlin Wall came down is that every single economy, including the U.S., has moved to be planned economy. There, there is no ability for the individual to react. There's no ability from the supply side of the economy to be 
what drives it. I mean, when Microsoft started in a garage in California, do you think they were sitting around trying to figure out where they fit into the demand curve? No, what they thought was, we have a great product, we will take a chance, we will take, you know, they, we will probably go bankrupt, but we take a chance to do what we do. So they created their own supply. So they are, are what, are, as an economist, I like to, to, to refer to a sales law, which said dictates the supply creates its own demand. And that is the way, Chris, we get through this crisis. It is to be more innovative. I mean, one of your expertises, of course, is energy. And, and that's another thing we haven't even discussed yet. But, I mean, energy is becoming so expensive again. At the same time as in, in inflation is dropping at, and in the rest of the economy, how can we have higher energy prices and falling inflation? Because, essentially, some part of the economy is inflationary due to QE, and some part of the economy is deflationary due to the fact that labor has no uh, wage power and that the economy has excess capacity. So we have, we have a society and an economy where you can, whatever, wherever, whatever you believe in, you can find it in pockets of the economy. Well, let's, let's switch gears to that for a bit. I, I'm really interested to continue this, this idea around resources and how access to resources is shaping the current landscape, maybe how you expect them to shape the future. So one of the ways that they're shaping our current uh, situation, which is what you mentioned, where we have low wage growth. Um, in some cases, it's actually negative wage growth. And we have rising costs for people. I, I, I do take exception with the idea that inflation is very low, because uh, when you, it, that's maybe true across everything in terms of how it's measured. But when you look at things, particularly here in the U.S., when it comes to tuition, health care and food and energy, those things are absolutely not in anything remotely close to a disinflationary environment. All of those are heading up um, reasonably smartly at this point in time. So when we look at this view of resources, how do you, if at all, do you see resource issues playing out in political and economic markets today? I think the, I think politics dictates every single macro impulse. So in other words, I think the policy mistakes conducted by politicians and policy makers is what makes markets, uh, that's what changes markets, that is what changes directions. Uh, I, I, I've thought that all through my life, and I've been more and more convinced every single day. So a great example of a misplaced energy policy is Germany. So after the Fukuyama incident, they decided to move away from nuclear power. Mm -hmm. So what the decision Germany then took at a 10,000 10, 10, 10, feet level is that they said, hang on a minute, because of the risk to nuclear power as a production, in terms of the uh, risk to you know, this melding or whatever could happen, we will instead take a higher dependency on natural gas from Russia. I think someone in Germany right now is, is regretting that on a political scale. But more importantly, energy in Germany today, due to this energy shift, is the most expensive in the world, except for my country, Denmark. So the fact that Germany wants to be most green actually has a side effect, which is that they have the most expensive electricity. BMW just recently moved a engine factory from Germany, southern Germany, to Seattle. They saved one-sixth the price of electricity. They, they physically, practically saved six times the price of electricity by moving to, to, to Washington State. So energy is, and people don't recognize this. You do, Chris. I know this is one of your, your main forces. But energy costs is a huge chunk of the input cost of anything that goes on. Every single app you drive on, you, you, you load into your, 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 your phone or whatever, has a high energy intensity. Recharging your iPhone costs more than having a, uh, a heater standing by every full year. I mean, people don't re realize that what they see as progress in terms of apps and, and, and online and everything actually has a server somewhere. They use massive amount of quantities of energy. So the energy consumption in the world is going up in a finite world because people can, can, can believe or not in Huber's peak, but the, as far as I know, the world is a finite. There's only a finite place in terms of geographic area and resources. It's not like it's being renewed by you know, someone coming from Mars and, and putting mm -hmm. more energy into it. So, so, so I agree with you. I know your point is that, that if you can understand energy, you can understand what goes on in the world. And for me, there is politically one thing that's more important than, than fossil uh, energy, and that is the fact, and, and, and this is a key fact to me, that inside, in 10 years, 
In 10 years' time from now, less than 50% of the, uh, the world's population have access to clean water. I mean, clean water, energy, in my opinion, is going to be the tulips, is going to be the, the, the thing everybody wants in the future. And I don't think anyone is prepared to. Countries like China, Singapore are deficient on water. Uh, countries like Germany, all of Europe, except for Denmark and Norway, are deficient on energy. So structurally, we put ourselves up being very, very unable to deal with what comes in the future in terms of our deficiencies. If anything, we are pushing further away from that equilibrium level, the development, the investment into these things uh, that, that should happen, because we pursue idiotic, in my opinion, things like windmills and stuff that, you you know, windmills have been around for 400 years. There must be a reason why they haven't become the number one energy source in the world, right? <laughs> Well, absolutely. You know, I've, I've been following very carefully what's been happening in Ukraine, particularly because of, of the large geopolitical wedge that seems to have been driven between Russia and the West and uh, seeing China right there with open arms. To me, the landmark deal was that gas deal where uh, essentially 20 percent of all Russian exports of gas are now going to redirect to China starting in 2018. And it's not clear to me that Russia has the capability to dial up its current production by 20 percent. It's a magnificent amount. And uh, so is there any concern at all anywhere in, on the European uh, continent, particularly in the monetary side, people who are looking at this saying, uh, where's our, our, is there any concern over supplies, not just cost, but supplies of, of the needed gas to run the economy? One of the biggest infrastructure projects in the EU right now is a re of the natural gas pipelines in Europe due to the fact that we became over-dependent on Russia. So, you know, we have a lot of uh, natural gas in the North Sea as well from Stad Oil in Norway. So they rerouted and, and spent a huge amount, I think, uh, if I'm not wrong, like $500 billion or something in total is the infrastructure project on this, which is behind the scene and not really uh, done so. But the, the short answer is no, Chris. I, I, I don't think anyone knows where to turn because as much as you and I and everybody else want alternative energy to become more of a force, we still have this storage issue in terms of energy, which I think we will deal with it over the next 10 years, certainly as we need to do it. But the Russian deal is very, very significant. The, the way Iran today you know, also... Uh, sort of bypass the international markets for its, its products. I mean, a lot of the producers in the world today is actually bypassing the international markets, which means that more and more money and more and more energy resources is given up and not coming to the world market. And I think, first of all, that is a concern for the market itself, but it is also a concern for you and me in terms of what will happen to energy prices. And, you know, I have friends that argue that the European monetary crisis, the debt crisis, actually started from the fact that we had deficiency in energy. So the energy cost actually killed uh, Italy, Spain, Greece, and all these countries, which uh, and, you know, at the start of this crisis took most of their natural gas from Libya. So I think it will be a huge input to uh, a potential downside. in, And that, that could actually be what gets us into a Japanization uh, in Europe. Uh, of course, in the U.S., you're less dependent on, on on, uh, on foreign uh, input imports these days, but on the other hand, you have, as far as I remember, a huge environmental issue in terms of doing sea dr uh, uh, open sea drilling and, and, and the likes, and tar sand, you know, everything being equal is probably not the most efficient way to, to go about uh, getting your energy out. So, you know, this morning I read shale gas uh, companies have the biggest debt per, per balance sheet of any companies in the, in the Russia's 3000. So, there's a number of issues, and I think the exploration cost of keeping this flow going is becoming immensely expensive. I think you showed it. Uh, you, you can follow up here, Chris, but I think you showed me a chart that between BP, Texaco, or whatever, all these guys, the exploration cost of actually maintaining their resources is up. Is it four or five times? Yeah, five times since 2000. Yeah, I mean, think about it. It's five times more expensive. At the same time, BP is being sued left, right, and center in the U.S., right? Yeah, yeah, and their and their production is actually uh, about flat from where it was in 2000. Hit a peak in 2005, six, and uh, and, and the truth is that uh, when we look at all the North American shale operators as a as a bucket, they're spending a dollar fifty in capex to get a dollar in revenue, and that's been true for five years. And these wells deplete in only three years. So the truth is that 
in my world, if you take a, comp a set of companies and they are all spitting out negative free cash flow when they are, should be in the peak of the stride of their current model, they've tapped the sweet spots, they're in the best plays, they've been drilling for long enough, and they're still spending more than they're earning, somebody really on the investment side needs to think about that carefully. Of course, we don't have a lot of careful in investing uh, happening right now. So I <laughs> So it, it, as we wrap this up, I'm, I'm really interested. We look forward. Uh, you look at equities. You look at bonds. You have to put your money somewhere. Where do you put it today? Okay, so let me, me sort of – so this has been, you know, very top-level macro. Here is my, my practice for you. Since Q3 of last year, I've been 70% in fixed income because I do believe and I continue to believe that we'll see new lows in interest rate. In a world that cannot restart itself, in a world that believes in – extend and pretend you will not have any activity, you don't have any move towards a mandate for change. So that means that the, the history tells us then that the only way we get change is through the system failing. And I'm not talking about a systemic failing, but I'm talking about people owning up to the fact that we need to activate the SME. So I think we'll see a progression towards SME. But in terms of the market, I have been very long fixed income and increasing the exposure right now from 70 to 90, taking whatever equity I had down. Not because I'm afraid of you know doom and gloom, but simply because I think you can have huge amount of leverage into the fixed income market here, where everybody seems to believe that interest rate cannot go lower. I see, and, and I was confirmed today by the Q1 data from the U.S., the world is simply stopping because the world is rebalancing. The U.S. current account deficit has moved from minus 800 to minus 400. The world needs $400 billion worth of new export markets before it gets back to break even. At the same time, Asia and China certainly are rebalancing away from nominal growth towards quality growth. Again, the first derivative of that is lower growth, inflate, deflation uh, export to the rest of the world. So I think the low comes in economically in Q1 and Q2 of 2015. Every single macro indicator you can find will bottom at uh, Q1, Q2. I think the equity market for me I've said all along, I think the top is 1900, 1950, uh, but I'm more, as you know, as, uh, when you make predictions, you can't both predict the level and the timing. Mm -hmm. And I'm more confident, confident about the timing than the level. So my timing I'm confident, and the timing I am confident on is the fact that second half of this year is going to see a 30% correction from the top. And Chris, that sounds a lot, but don't forget every five years we have a 25-30% correction. So it's way inside the norm on what the stock market has done since World War II. But I think the corporate balance sheet are in a better position, but I think the volume they can sort of send to the marketplace will be significantly lower as we go to the second end. So the B, two big trades I have on right now is that yield, core yield, especially Germany, U.S., Canada, Norway, Denmark will go to new lows. They will retest the lows we saw during the financial crisis. And the second thing is that Germany will be very, very close to recession because they are the one that is being hurt the most by falling export volumes, certainly to the Asia, but also to the U.S. now. And there Germany stands and stood very strong. Nine, 12 months from this being implemented is about July, August. Uh, we will see this impact in Germany. If Germany gets to 0% growth, you and I know, Chris, that then Spain, France, Portugal will be at, um, you know, m with a mar wide margin be negative in growth. I think that is the mandate for change. I think the mandate for change is that when Germany gets into trouble, Europe is in trouble. That will create some sort of uh, activity where you have the mandate to do something you cannot do right now because right now people are just buying paper money and not investing in real people. So long fixing income is 30% correction in the equity that needs to be used to be buying long term. And then I think you need to start looking at two specific sectors in my opinion, mining overall and uh, secondly emerging market as a, as a play. Uh, Brazil is a, is a horrible macro story but a great micro story. There are great businesses like Vale, uh, the, the iron coal producer in Brazil, now trading at almost all-time low. But, you know, tell you what, Chris, the world is not going on. The, you know, demand will be back ultimately. But there, there is this cleansing process over the next 6 to 12 months that you need to be using proactively. But I do believe this is the low. So it's not doom and gloom speech here. This is, I think, use 14 to clean up, to reconfigure, and certainly, as per your advice, look at how you become more energy efficient 
and you know don't count on any support from central banks don't count on any support from the politician this is about you running your business in a in, in a better way more efficient way and hire smarter people because at the end of the day what needs to be done all over the world is to invest in people i agree i agree well i i since you briefly almost touched on it. I have to ask, what, what's your view on gold uh, during this uh, next cycle through uh, Q1, Q2, 2015? So the significantly low interest rate will ultimately uh, start to support gold. But the problem is, as you say in your lead into this uh, talk, the problem is that the inflation expectation continues to fall down. And I expect inflation expectation to bottom between now and Q4. So I see gold bottoming out in timing-wise. Again, I'm more confident about the, the timing than the, the price, but in timing-wise, I see Q3 as a low in gold. Uh, mining apes prices, you know, to mine gold is about 1100 on average, as far as I know. Uh, supply will be you know, closed down, as we've seen, certainly in diamonds and in iron ore productivity. We have new CEOs of all the mining companies as well. I think the mining the mining companies are actually one of the few businesses in this cycle that had felt the crisis truly, and their response has been to cut investments and to cut mining capacity. Mm -hmm. I think the demand is pretty much stable in terms of gold and other uh, assets in, in, in metals. So for me, I am buying Alcor, I'm buying Valle in, in Brazil in terms of uh, the stocks. So I'm buying the individual companies because any day, Chris, I'd rather buy a company than I buy a story. I believe in people. I don't believe in PowerPoints. <laughs> wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. You've been extremely generous with your time. I, I love your views, uh, Steen, just very practical and, and uh, very grounded. I, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you. And uh, if people want to follow you more closely going forward, how would they do that? Uh, Saxo Bank, the organization I work for, has a very neat uh, website that does research, and not just me, but a whole bunch of people, including external people, and it's called uh, tradingfloor.com. So tradingfloor, in one word, .com, tradingfloor.com, where everything's available. Uh, I don't even think you have to sign up, but if you sign up, you have some added benefit of getting whatever research you want. And maybe, Chris, the thing we need to do is to get you to do one or two blocks in there because I think your input is, and you and Adam's input is so important. And, and what you're going on at Prosperity to me is very, very interesting and something I would love for more people, at least in my part of the world, to, to both see and, and listen to. Oh, well, thank you so much for that. I, I would love to get the views out. It, it truly seems to me that there's a... Um... There's an additional element to this story that needs to be dragged into it, and, and we have to be looking at it just fundamentally differently. So you've heard my talk, and people listening to this probably have as well, but uh, would love the opportunity to uh, test these ideas out and expose people to them and, and uh, refine them and, and get better at uh, figuring out where this is all headed. So, Steen, thank you so much for your time today. It's been a real pleasure, and I hope we can do it again. Absolutely, Chris. It was a great honor being on your on your program, and I hope to see you soon in uh, beautiful California. <laughs> Very good. All right. Thank you, and have a great day. Thank you.